The Social Basis of the Women Question by Alexander Kolentai, dated 1909. Leaving it to the bourgeois scholars to observe themselves in the discussion of the question of the superiority of one sex over the other, or in the weighing of brains and the comparing of the psychological structure of men and women, the followers of historical materialism fully accept the natural specificities of each sex in the bed only that each person, whether men or women, has a real opportunity for the fullest and freest self-determination in the widest scope for the development and application of all natural inclinations. The followers of historical materialism reject the existence of a special women question separate from the general social question of our day. Specific economic factors were behind the subordination of women. Natural qualities have been a secondary factor in this process. Only the complete disappearance of these factors, only the evolution of those forces which at some point in the past gave rise to the subjection of women, is able in a fundamental way to influence and change their social position. In other words, women can truly can become truly free and equal only in a world organized along new social and productive lines. This, however, does not mean that the partial improvement of women's life within the framework of the modern system is impossible. The radical solution of the worker's question is possible only with the complete reconstruction of the modern productive relations. But must this prevent us from the working for reforms which would serve to satisfy the most urgent interests of the proletariat and the country? Each new gain of the working class represents a step leading mankind towards the kingdom of freedom and social equality. Each right that woman wins brings her nearer the defined goal of full emancipation. Social democracy was the first to include in its programming the demand for the equalization of the rights of women with those of men. In speeches and in print, the party demands always and everywhere the withdrawal of limitations affecting women. It is the party's influence alone that has forced other parties and governments to carry out reforms in favor of women. In Russia, this party is not only the defender of women in terms of theoretical positions, but always and everywhere adheres to the principle of women's equality. What, in this case, hinders our equal writers from accepting the support of this strong and experienced party? The fact is that however radical the equal writers may be, they are still loyal to their own bourgeois class. Political freedom is at the moment an essential prerequisite for the growth and power of the Russian bourgeoisie. Without it, all the economic welfare of the latter will turn out to have been built upon sand. The demand for political equality is for women a necessity that stems from life itself. The slogan of access to the professions has ceased to suffice. Only direct participation in the government of the country promises to assist in raising women's economic situation. Hence, the passionate desire of women of the middle bourgeoisie to gain the franchise, and hence their hostilities 
to the modern bureaucratic system. However, if their demands for political equality, our feminists are like their foreign sisters. The wide horizons opened by social democratic learning remain alien and incomprehensible to them. The feminists seek equality in the framework of existing class society. In no way do they attack the basis of this society. They fight for prerog prerogatives for themselves without challenging the existing prerogatives and privileges. We do not accuse the representatives of the bourgeois women's movement of failure to understand the matter. Their view of things flow inevitably from their class position. The struggle for economic independence. First of all, we must ask ourselves whether a single united women's movement is possible in a society based on class contradictions. The fact that the women who take part in the liberation movement do not represent one homogeneous mass is clear to every unbiased observer. The women's world is divided just as is the world of men into two camps. The interests and aspirations of one group of women bring it close to the bourgeois class, while the other group has close connections with the proletariat, and its claims for liberation encompasses a full solution to the women question. Thus, although both camps follow the general slogan of the liberation of women, their aims and interests are different. Each of the groups unconsciously takes its starting point from the interests of its own class, which gives a specific class coloring to the targets and tasks itself. Tasks it sets itself. However, Apparently, radical demands to the feminists, one might not lose sight of the fact that the feminists cannot, on account of their class position, fight for that fundamental transformation of the contemporary economic and social structure of society without which the liberation of women cannot be complete. If in certain circumstances the short-term tasks of women of all classes coincide, the final aims of the two camps which in the long term determine the direction of the movement and the tactics to be used, differ sharply. While for the feminists the achievement of equal rights with men in the framework of the contemporary work capitalist world represents a sufficiently concrete end in itself, equal rights at this present time are, for the proletarian woman, only a means of advancing the struggle against the economic slavery of the working class. The feminists see men as the main enemy. For men have unjustly seized all rights and privileges for themselves, leaving women only chains and duties. For them, a victory is won when a prerogative previously enjoyed exclusively by the male sex is conceded to the fair sex. Proletarian women have a different attitude. They do not see men as the enemy and the oppressor. On the contrary, they think men as their comrades who share with them the drudgery of the daily round and fight with them for a better future. The woman and her male comrade are enslaved by the same social conditions. The same heated chains of capitalism oppress their will and deprive them of the joys and charms of life. It is true that several specific aspects of the contemporary system lie with double weight upon women, as it is also true that the conditions of hired labor sometimes turn working women into competitors and rivals to men. When, but in these unfavorable situations, the working class knows who is guilty. The woman, worker, no less than her brother is in misfortune. 
repeats that insatiable monster with its gilded bar which concerned only to drain all the sap from its victims and to grow at the expense of millions of human lives, throws itself with equal greed at men, women, and child. Thousands of friends bring the working man close. The aspirations of the bourgeois woman, on the other hand, seem strange and, in and incomprehensible. They are not warning to the proletarian heart. They do not promise the proletarian woman that bright future towards which the eyes of all exploited humanity are turned. The proletarian woman's final aim does not, of course, prevent them from desiring to improve their status even within the framework of the current bourgeois system. The realization of these desires is constantly hindered by obstacles that derive from the very nature of capitalism. A woman can possess equal rights and be truly free only in a world of socialized labor, of harmony and justice. The feminists are unwilling and incapable of understanding this. It seems to them that when equality is firmly accepted by the letter of the law, they will be able to win a comfortable place for themselves in the old world of oppression and slavery and bondage, of tears and hardship. And this is true up to a certain point. For the majority of women of the proletariat, equal rights with men mean only an equal share in inequality. But for the chosen few, for the bourgeois woman, it would indeed open doors to new and unprecedented rights and privileges that until now have been enjoyed by men of the bourgeois class alone. But each new concession won by the bourgeois woman would give her yet another weapon of, for the exploitation of her younger sister, and would go on increasing the division between the women of the two opposite social camps. Their interests would be more sharply in conflict, their aspirations more obviously in contradiction. Where then is that general woman question? Where is that unity of tasks and aspirations about which the feminists have so much to say? A sober glance at reality shows that such unity does not and cannot exist. In vain, the feminists try to assure themselves that the woman question has nothing to do with that of the political party, and that its solution is possible only with the participation of all parties and all women. As one of the radical German feminists has said, the logic of facts forces us to reject this comforting this delusion of the feminists. The conditions and forms of production have subjugated women throughout human history and have gradually relegated them to the position of oppression, dependence, in which most of them existed until now. A colossal upheaval of the entire social and economic structure was required before women could begin to retrieve the significance and independence they had lost. Problems which at one time seemed too difficult for the most talented thinkers have now been solved by the inanimate but all-powerful condi condi conditions of production. The same forces which for thousands of years enslaved women now, at, f at a further stage of development, are leading them along the path to freedom and independence. The woman question assumed importance for women of the bourgeois classes approximately in the middle of the 19th century. A considerable time after the proletarian woman had arrived in the labor arena. Under the impact of the monstrous successes of capitalism, the middle classes of the population were hit 
by the waves of need. The economic changes had rendered the financial situation of the petty and middle bourgeoisie unstable, and the bourgeois women were faced with a dilemma of menacing proportions. Either accept poverty or achieve the right to work. Wives and daughters of these social groups began to knock at the doors of the universities, the art salons, the editorial houses, the offices, flooding to the professions that were open to them. The desire of bourgeois women to gain access to science and the higher benefits of culture was not the result of sudden, maturing, needy, need, but stemmed from the same question of daily bread. The women of the bourgeoisie met for the very first with stiff resistance from men. A stern burn battle was waged between the professional men attached to their cozy little jobs and the women who were novices in the manner of earning their daily bread. This struggle gave rise to feminism. The attempt of bourgeois women to stand together and pit their current strength against the enemy, against men. As they entered the labor arena, these women were proudly referred to themselves as the vanguard of the women's movement. They forget that in this matter of winning economic independence, they were, as in other fields, traveling in the footsteps of their younger sisters and reaping the fruits of the efforts of their blistered hands. Is it really, is it then really possible to talk of the feminists pioneering the road to women's work, when in every country hundreds of thousands of proletarian women have flooded the factories and workshops, taken over one branch of industry after another before the bourgeois women's movement was ever born, only thanks to the fact that the labor of women workers had received recognition on the world market where the bourgeois women were able to occupy the independent position in society in which the feminists take so much pride. We find it difficult to point to even one fact in the history of the struggle of the proletarian women to improve their material conditions to which the general feminist movement had, has contributed significantly. Whatever the proletarian women have achieved in the sphere of raising their own living standards is a result of the efforts of the working class in general and of, the, of themselves in particular. The history of the struggle of the working women for better conditions of labor and for a more decent life is the history of the struggle of the proletariat for its liberation. Where, what if not the fear of dangerous explosion of proletarian dissatisfaction forces the factory orders to raise the price of labor, reduce hours, and introduce better working conditions? What if that the fear of labor unrest persuades the government to establish legislation to limit the exploitation of labor by capital? This is not one party in the world that has taken up the defense of women as social democracy has done. The working woman is first and foremost a member of the working class and the more satisfactory the position and general welfare of each member of the proletarian family, the greater the benefit in the long run to the whole of the working class. In the face of the growing social difficulties, the sincere fighter for the cause must stop in sad, in sad bewilderment. She cannot but see how little the general women's movement has done for the proletarian woman, how incapable it is of improving the working and living conditions of the working class. The future of humanity must seem gray, drab, and uncertain to those women who are fighting for equality but have not, a, but who have not adopted the proletarian world outlook or developed a firm faith in the coming of a more perfect social system. While the contemporary capitalist world remains unchanged, 
liberation must seem to them incomplete and impartial. What despair must grip the more, more thoughtful and sensitive of these women. Only the working class is capable of maintaining morale in the modern world with its distorted social relations. What with firm and measured step it advances steadily towards it towards its aim. It draws the working woman to its ranks. The proletarian woman bravely starts out on the thorny path of labor. Her legs sag, her body is torn. There are dangerous precipices along the way, and cruel beasts of prey are close at hand. But only by taking this path is the woman able to achieve that distant but alluring aim. Her true liberation in a new world of labor, during this difficult march to the bright future, the proletarian woman, until recently a humiliated, downtrodden slave with no rights learns to discard the slave mentality that has clung to her. Step by step, she transforms herself into an independent worker and an independent personality, free in love. It is she, fighting in the ranks of the proletariat, who wins for women the right to work. It is she, the younger sister, who prepares the ground for the free and equal women of the future. For what reason, then, should the woman worker seek a union with the bourgeois feminists? Who, in actual fact, would stand to gain in the event of such an alliance? Certainly not the woman worker. She is her own savior. Her future is in her own hands. The working woman guards her class interests and is not deceived by great speeches about the world all women share. The working woman must not and does not forget, while the aim of the bourgeois women is to secure their own welfare and the framework of a society antagonistic to us, our aim is to build in the place of the old, outdated world a bright temple of universal labor and camaraderie, solidarity, and joyful freedom.